some instruction about that. All right, let's dismiss our young people to go to their class downstairs, and we're going to pick up where we left off two weeks ago, Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter number 18. Wasn't our praise and pie service a blessing? Uh, didn't you enjoy that? And uh, the testimonies and the preaching and uh, uh, just the, the way that God worked and the way that God blessed. And we certainly do praise the Lord for that. Acts chapter number 18. In this chapter, today we're going to talk about this subject. The gospel doesn't stop with me. The gospel doesn't stop with me. And we're going to look at a new Bible character uh, today. Uh, his name is Apollos. He's only mentioned ten times in the Word of God, but he's a, a very notable Bible character, and he's somebody that we can learn a lot of lessons from. So Acts chapter 18 and verse number 24. The Bible says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Remember, Aquila and Priscilla, they were tent makers. He st uh, the, the, uh, Paul stayed with them. Look at verse 27. The Bible says, And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now, Apollos is mainly mentioned uh, in the book of the Corinthians, uh, the church at Corinth. But he is somebody that as we study scripture, he grew incredibly uh, as a Christian. And the Bible says, if you notice in that first verse we read, that the only thing he started with was the baptism of John. And John's message, what did John preach? John preached, repent, for there's one coming after me. We know that one is our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he had that first part of repenting, but he needed to receive Jesus Christ. And Aquila and Priscilla, they come alongside of him and help him understand the word of God. Helped him with discipleship. Ultimately helped him with this uh, relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so not only as we read this, do you and I need to grow in our faith and in our Christianity, uh, but we are commanded to grow in our faith. Uh, yet, uh, two weeks ago, I, I, I prayed with a group of men uh, before our service starts, and, I, and I, I looked at each one of them pointedly, and I, I said, you need to grow as a Christian, just as I need to grow as a Christian. And if I had the time today, I could put, uh, point my finger at every face today, not in an offensive way, but rather as an instructional way, based on the Word of God, that we need to grow as a Christian. Just as the Bible commands, honor thy father and mother, the Bible also says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is instruction. It is an imperative telling you and I to grow. And since none of us uh, are to stay as babies in Christ, uh, we, let's look at it. Number one, God wants you to grow. Not only should you grow, but God wants you to grow. And we're going to look a little deeper in the life of Apollos and see he grew quickly. I mean, his growth was dynamic. I want you to see that Apollos was a person in the Word. Look at verse 24 again, Acts 18, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. He was a person in the word. Don't miss this. He was in the word of God. 
He wanted to understand Scripture. 25, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the Spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And not just hearing the Word, but also wanting to be in a church that is Bible-heavy. I, I repeat this over and over again. Someone often reaches out and says, what does your church offer? Uh, uh, listen, what we offer is the Word of God. What we want to pride ourselves in, if anything, is our growing in the grace of Jesus Christ. What we don't want to do is just try to offer uh, the, the next Gidget or Gasmo uh, 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 to, to compete with church so-and-so. We're not in comp competition with the kingdom of God. What we do want to do is as God uh, uh, allows us to come together in worship of him is to make good use of our time in knowing his word and studying his word and allowing his word to change us so that we are more like him. So Apollos was a person in the word. He was also a, a person of the word of the word. Uh, again, this guy studied the word of God. We see it in verse 25. He, he heard the word. He, he listened to the word. He was all about the word. If, if you and I are going to grow, it's going to be because of the Bible. Someone says, well, I'm growing because I'm serving. Understand, if you think you're growing because you're serving, you will burn out. Somebody say amen. But if you're serving because you're growing in the Word of God, you will see fruit that remains. It is important that our foundation is found in the Word of God. He was a person by the Word. Let me say it like this. No Bible, no growth. If the Bible is not a part of your life, you are not growing. Little Bible, little growth. If the Bible only has a little part of your life, you're not growing very much. But more Bible, more growth. And the Bible says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's by the Word of God. Peter gives that analogy. He talks about a seed being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Jesus talked about this in the parable of the sower, the seed, and the soil. And, and the one unchanging thing about that is the seed. If we're not planting the seed of the word of God into the soil of our heart, we will not grow. And I need to be in a church where the word of God is the priority. I need to live my life where the Word of God is the priority. If my job is more important than my relationship with Christ, I've missed my purpose. If my hobbies, my passions, my addictions, uh, uh, whatever the case may be, are mo my favorite shows, my favorite things, are, are, are more important than my relationship with God, I have misplaced uh, 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 things that are in my life. And so we must have the seed of the Word of God in order to grow. It's so, so, so important. And, and yes, tomorrow when I wake up, I'll have a busy week in front of me. But regardless of how busy the week is that's in front of me, I need the Word of God. I need to be meditating on the Word and thinking on the Word. And, and, and that's why we as a church, we, we offer different opportunities. I realize they don't work for everyone. On Thursday night, we study the Word of God. And on, on Saturday morning, we, we study the Word of God. By the way, on Saturday morning, if you don't know it, you can ask me personally. I'll give you the Zoom link. One of the beauties of Saturday morning is you can study the Word of God in your pajamas. Uh, you, can, you can roll out of bed and sip hot chocolate or coffee and, 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 and listen to the Word of God. And we study a different book of the Bible uh, and, and, and understand that, that what we want to do is teach the Word of God so that we grow in the Word of God, but not only do we need the gatherings of God's people, but individually, we also need to read God's Word and to study God's Word and to think on God's Word. The Bible says, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I say unto you, they are spirit, they are life. No Bible, no growth. Little Bible, little growth. Much Bible, much growth. 
And understand, I don't want to just grow in my Bible knowledge and be filled with jealousy and pride and envy. There's plenty of people, if they're not careful, that, that, that they, they begin to grow in Bible knowledge. And it's like, okay, I'm cutting off Christmas, I'm cutting off Christmas trees, I'm cutting off, you know, they start with the holidays. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting off uh, Thanksgiving because it's not about turkeys, and I'm cutting off uh, Valentine's Day because it's all about cupids, and, and I'm cutting off this. And listen, if, if you're growing and cutting off stuff and you become judgmental of others, you're doing it wrong. Because Christianity is not about comparing your life to somebody else's life or looking down at... Listen, if you don't put up a Christmas tree, that's fine. But don't judge the person that does. I won't meddle anymore. Uh, uh, But but understand, uh, the question really is this. It's all about the Word of God. And this would be a really good spot to stop and say, before you came to church today, what did you read in the Word of God? Okay, I was going to church, Pastor. I, I'll give you, I'll, 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 I'll give you, you still have 12 hours before the day, 13 hours before the day is over. So I'm going to give you a pass. What did you read yesterday? Well, that was Saturday. I had the day off. Okay. What did you read Friday? You, again, we're not careful. What we do is we lull ourselves into, into distancing from the Word of God, and, and we stop growing in the Word of God. And may, we, may our, our bodies take physical rest. Thank God for holidays. Thank God for times when we can sit back and reflect and be thankful like we were this past week. But may we also realize the desperation that we have for God and his presence in our life. Listen, the devil doesn't take a day off. The, the devil doesn't say, okay, I'm going to give your family a break. Uh, you, uh, I put you through the ringer, uh, so, so let me give you a little space to catch up. No, we're in a battle. We're in a war. Uh, we, we need the Spirit of God and the presence of God and the power of God. It is the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever. And the Bible says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's everything that we need. This past week, Kate and I, we went back to uh, the Midwest, where I was born, where I grew up. There was a small Midwestern town where there was a little poor kid by the name of Frankie. And uh, Frankie was so poor, and each year they had a little town uh, and a town park. The town park was called Central Park. It wasn't like our Central Park, but it was just centrally located in the middle of the town. And every year for Christmas, they would have a a, a church choir that would sing, and Santa Claus would be there, and they would have the the uh, the lights and the decorations and serving hot chocolate and 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 just a, a fun, festive atmosphere. Well, when Santa Claus came, if the parents gave uh, Santa Claus a gift, then Santa Claus would call the name of the child, and, uh, and, and then they would receive their gift uh, from somebody dressed up as Santa Claus. Well, Frankie ne- knew that he would never get a gift because he was just too poor. But he kept going back and back and back to this thing uh, for several years. And he had a couple of friends. One of the friends, his name was Stuart Yancey. Stuart Yancey, uh, his dad was a doctor, very wealthy, very influential. They, they went back to this Christmas festival, and Santa Claus called the name Stuart Yancey. And, and Frankie was so happy for his friend Stuart that his name was called by Santa Claus. And the gift that he got, the wrapping was so beautiful that the wrapping was more valuable than any gift that Frankie had ever even received. And much to his surprise... After that gift was open, Santa Claus called Frankie's name, Frank Norris. And Frankie was so excited. And he sheepishly went up there and received his gift. And there was a small uh, rectangular gift about this big. It was wrapped up in, in some old newspaper. And he carefully uh, uh, unwrapped that as he uh, came back to where he was with, with his friend, uh, uh, Stuart, and Stuart began just to mock mercilessly. Is that all you got? Is that all you got? And he, he opened, and there was a New Testament. In that New Testament, his, his mom wrote him a, an affectionate note in there that make the Word of God the priority in your life. Some of you may or may not know the name. J. Frank Norris, about 100 years ago, 
a uh, uh, little less than that, went on and built two of the, uh, God used him to lead two of the largest churches in America. As a matter of fact, at the same time, Frank Norris pastored a church in Michigan and a church in Texas, both of them larger congregations than a thousand people at the very same time, at a time when transportation was not readily as, 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 as uh, helpful as it is today. There was a time uh, when he was about my age or so that uh, uh, Mr. Norris was walking through the street uh, with somebody from his church just reflecting on the goodness of God and the work of grace that God is doing in their churches and the work of grace that, that God is doing in, in people's lives and through their ministry. And he was walking. He, he walked past a bench. And past the bench, he, he, he smelled an odor. And, and he saw somebody lay on the bench. And beside the bench, there was a man there that had a shopping cart with all of his belongings in the shopping cart. And the man smelled like urine smelled like alcohol. And he looked down and kept walking and did a double take and walked back and he said, Stuart? Stuart? It was his friend, Stuart Yancey. And in that moment, all J. Frank Norris could think of as a kid was when he said, is that all you got? Is that all you got? And Frank Norris, as he gave the gospel to his friend, he said, my mom gave me all I need. I had all I needed in the word of God. <laughs> Folks, as Christians, we're, the, there's so much competition the world is throwing out there for your time. There's so many things that for your attention that we, we need to chase after, after. May our priority be growing in the word of God. May our priority be growing as a Christian. May our, your daily prayer be, Lord, increase my faith. God wants you to grow. Number two, uh, uh, God has a process for you to grow. Not just the person, but God has a process. God has a plan for your life. We say to children all the time, God has a plan for your life. But there's a message next week for everybody in the nursing home. God still has a plan for your life. Whether you're at the beginning of your life or the end of your life, God still has a plan for your life. And understand, it can be a slow process. It can be a slow process, growing in grace, growing in Christ. Look at verse 25 again. The Bible says, This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the Spirit, and he uh, uh, spake and taught diligently of the things of the Lord. Now realize, he, he, was, he was slow in this. But God grew him. It wasn't uh, all of a sudden from a, a little seed to a mighty orchard in one day. It took some time. God grew him incrementally. Look at verse uh, chapter 19. I'm now in Acts 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, That they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Let me remind you of this today. Your relationship with Jesus needs to lead you to a deeper relationship with Jesus, and if not, your Christianity is broken. If you're growing in Bible knowledge and you're a jerk to people, your Christianity is broken. Husbands, if you're a jerk to your wife, but you want to spit out scriptures in an argument? You missed it. Everybody say amen right there. Amen. Wives, I'm going to leave you alone because I'm married. <laughs> uh, understand, 
We're talking about not just possessing. A, too many people want to weaponize the word of God. They're mad at somebody, so they find a verse that fits their narrative, and they plast it on social media uh, as if, I'm going to get you good with this one. Uh, 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 the devil's coming after you. That's not the word of God. When you study the ministry of Jesus and what it is that we are as Christians and what we are called to be, we're to be different. Christ should be magnified in my body. They had the repentance of John, but they, 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 they did not fully understand receiving Christ, and so they get it. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Apollos was educated, but he had a very limited knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 26, back in chapter 18, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Again, can I say today that we need the Word of God. We need the Word of God uh, as we grow in our collective set settings as a church, but we also need the Word of God individually in our lives. And yes, it can be a slow process, but realize this, our growth is personal. Our growth is personal. The Bible says it was a certain Jew. We all grow at different rates uh, for different reasons. But if I uh, compare my growth to somebody else's growth, and the Bible says comparing ourselves among ourselves is not wise. If I start talking about, well, listen, we all should be giving, but I'm not going to compare myself to what you give. We all should be sharing the gospel. But I'm not going to compare my, uh, my, my minutes that I share the gospel to your minutes that you share the gospel. We all should be reading the Bible. But I'm not going to compare my chapters to the chapters that you read. We, you follow me? We, we can fill in the blank there. But it's not for us to compare ourselves uh, among ourselves. However, we all should be looking at Jesus. But when I start looking at your works and what you're doing, and I'm better than you, and I accomplish more than you, notice my eyes are off Jesus, and I'm going in the wrong direction. And we should all be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And that's why we must look on him and realize our growth it involves other people. It involves other people. We're talking about growing, maturing, discipling. Verse number 26 again, at chapter 18, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. In other words, they spent time with him, carving out time in their schedule, intentionally. One of the things that I want to encourage everyone to do, you do not need a church title to invest in somebody else's life. One of the greatest things you can ever do is invite somebody to lunch or invite someone out for a cup of coffee or have a friendly conversation, a, a friendly visit. And it doesn't mean you have to take a concordance and, 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 and fill yourself with Bible knowledge and say, this is what you should do, but rather admonishing and encouraging and helping and pouring in to somebody else's life. It's very noteworthy. Apollos was an educated man, white collar, wealthy, had money, had knowledge, intimidating. Aquila and Priscilla, they were more blue collar. They were tent makers. And yet he said, those that some would say are beneath my social arena, they have something to offer me. And he humbled himself and learned from them, and God blessed that incredibly. All of us need a mentor. Uh, when I went to a funeral last Monday back in central Illinois, I, I went and saw the man uh, that, that we, uh, one of my youth leaders, that, that he, he was never paid by the church to do what he did. He just volunteered his time, took us on act activities. I uh, hope he does not hear him this right now. Hopefully he's at his church. Uh, but but I, I told him, I said, man, I, I sure gave you a run for your money at times, didn't I? And I expected him to say, oh, Ken, I love you so much. And he's like, yeah, you sure did. I'm like, well, 
Honesty is good, I guess. Uh, but I, I went back and I saw the pastor that was my pastor when I was a kid still pastoring the same church over 30 years later and praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for people that poured into me. Praise the Lord for people that invested in me. Praise the Lord for people that didn't give up on me even when I wasn't that polished child uh, that, that they, they saw running around the church. All of us need somebody to pour into our lives. There are so many people, though, that they don't have enough humility to realize that others can help them, that others can teach them. There are some that they want a relationship with the Lord, but they don't want an under-shepherd in their life. And I say this very humbly, but one of God's gifts to Christians is the church. And God uses under-shepherds to lead his church, to teach and expound upon his perfect word. And so our, our growth is personal. Each one of us should be growing. Our growth, it involves others. But here it is, get this. You are part of God's plan to help others grow. You are part of God's plan to help others grow. Look at verse 27. And when he was disposed to, possess, to, uh, to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. We all need someone to pour into us. And we also need somebody to pour our life into. It's kind of like links of a chain. It's so important that we realize that the gospel is not, okay, got to me, we're good. That's not it. It is about the gospel going through me so that I get it to somebody else. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.2, And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Someone taught me, I taught others, they're going to teach others. That's what Paul's saying to Timothy. In other words, four generations are present there. There was someone that poured into me. I'm thankful for the pastor that poured into my parents. I'm thankful for the Billy Graham crusade that went through St. Louis where my dad heard the gospel message preached. I'm thankful for, for the pastors that I had that God used to lead me to the Lord. It's my prayer that, that as my children grow in grace, that they will pour into somebody else and that you will pour into somebody else and, and make sure that we are encouraging and loving and helping and instructing. We must make sure that we're building bridges to others. Next week uh, on, on uh, Sunday, we're going to take a bunch of uh, bears to the, the uh, uh, nursing home. But this is much greater than a $5 contribution to somebody that's lonely. This is about giving the gospel to somebody that could be at the very end of their life and helping them understand there is hope in Jesus Christ. And just as the gospel came to you, just as the gospel came to me, you know, we live in a world where if we're not careful, we become desensitized to other people's needs. The, 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 you know, the Haitian people, they're, they're, their country is poor, they this, you, you know, we've got enough, uh, 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 we don't have any more room in America for anyone to help anybody else, and, uh, and, and this and that. And we have an opportunity to, to give gifts to other people that we will never meet. And with those gifts uh, comes the gospel of Jesus Christ that we get to pour into and, and love. And, and, and that's why we sacrifice. Uh, every single month, it, it just costs thousands of dollars to pay the, the utility bills and the mortgage payment and fixing the, 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 the heater on the roof again this week. And, and, and why do we give over and over and over and over again? Because we want this church 
to shine as a lighthouse in this community. The day is going to come, probably in the next few weeks, I'm going to give you a little bit more instruction as we as a church begin to gently prepare for the spring for additional Sunday morning services. That means our Sunday services won't look like what they look like right now. Uh, But when we have more services, we're going to have more room for growth. But what I want to warn everyone of is this. If we all say, well, I just love it the way it is right now, we've ceased to be a church and we've become a club. And there's going to take more work. There's going to be inconvenience. Understand, if we put all the cool kids in one service, and then the nine people that don't like people in their own service. (laughs) Have you ever been in a service of nine people? I don't know about you. Maybe it's just me. It's miserable. Now, as a faithful preacher of the gospel, I need to continually preach. But what I love is the opportunity. I love people. And I want you to understand, someone said, well, I don't have a ministry title. The fact that you're here is a beautiful thing. And somebody is encouraged by your faithfulness. I saw plenty of people in their 70s and even 80s at a funeral this past Monday that I never walked up to one time as a kid and said, thank you for being faithful to the cause of Christ. Those words just didn't come out of me as as a 12-year-old. But it meant something something to me to see somebody faithful to Jesus decade after decade after decade after decade. And I don't have the the well-laid-out 10-year plan for our church. I've not set any specific numerical goal for our church. Our goal is Jesus. We're going to follow him. We're going to let him take care of the results. But the only way we grow is through his word. If you're here today, again, let me say this before before I close. There are plenty of, of religions that talk about heaven. No one uses hell as their selling point. No, No one's in favor of going to hell. Plenty of false religions use heaven as a selling point. But here's what differentiates Christianity. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. You need a relationship with Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the only way to know Jesus is the Word. If you're here today, and you say, Ken, I'm, I'm new to, to the church. I'm glad I'm here. I enjoy the choir. How do I meet Jesus? I want you to understand. First, it takes an understanding that every person is a sinner. There, the Bible says there's not one good person on the earth. There's none righteous, no, not one. I, I say it frequently. I, I make bad decisions. I say wrong things. I, you could go on and on and on, and as you track my life, the, the track record is very clear. I am a miserable failure. I am a sinner against a holy God, and so are you. But the Bible tells us because we're sinners, we've got to pay for that sin. Sin has separated us from God. But Jesus, he came, and he paid for our sin so that you and I can have eternal life. He shed his blood to cover our sins. And we praise the Lord for that. And if we, by faith, confess our sins with the mouth, uh, with the heart, man, believe within the righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made in the salvation. And and if, if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his finished work that he did on the cross, the Bible says he will give us the gift of eternal life. And if you're here today, if you've never received the gift of eternal life, there's not a better time or a place to do it 
than right here in the house of God. And if you'd like to call upon Jesus and receive that free gift by faith, he wants to give you eternal life right now. But this is not just about one day going to heaven. This is about having Jesus with me all the time, residing in my heart, uh, going with me, uh, and knowing that he's with me, where his promise says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you'd like to call upon the Lord, I invite you to do that now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're not saved today, Jesus knows your heart. You can call upon him and ask him to save you. You say, I don't know what to say. Tell him you're a sinner. Admit your sin to him. Ask him to come into your heart and save you. It's not about getting the words right. It's about the posture of your heart realizing that you cannot save yourself. You're lost, helpless, and separated from God. Maybe you're here today, and you say, Pastor Ken, I know that I'm saved. Can I encourage you as we study this passage? May we more than ever be fervently involved in growing as a Christian and in helping others grow. As we conclude today, Maybe your prayer just needs to be, God, help me to be a student of the Bible. Maybe you need to read the Word of God more daily. Maybe your prayer today is, God, help me to impact somebody else's life. Maybe you've been consumed with your own growth, but you've not focused on impacting somebody else's life. And maybe God's speaking to your heart about giving, investing in somebody else, making a difference so that the word of God, the gospel of Jesus, can continue to somebody else. I'm going to pray, but as I pray, let me encourage you also to talk to the Lord in prayer as God speaks to your heart. Father, we thank you for your word today.